Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about museum studies and education with Dr. Janetta B. Cole. Dr. Cole is director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. Dr. Cole is a former president of both Spelman College and Bennett College. Dr. Cole earned her PhD at Northwestern University and at last count has 61 honorary doctorates. Welcome, Dr. Cole. I'm pleased to be here. Well, I'm delighted that you're here. And I want to just say for the record that that was not a mistake. You really do have 61 honorary doctorates. It is true. It is true. And I am deeply honored in receiving each of them because an honorary doctorate really is a statement about work. That's all it is, that you've done some work. But I think it also has a second message. Thank you for doing good work. Now go do some more. Well, speaking of having done some good work and doing some more, uh, you were a very distinguished educator, and now you're doing very good work at the Smithsonian. Would you mind saying a word or two about how you see that intersection? Mm. The most important thing to say is if we can remain flexible and open, take good care of our health, there's an interesting possibility for each of us, I think, to just switch, to change, to explore other career options. One of my very dear friends in the world is Mary Catherine Bateson, an anthropologist, well known, of course, because she's the daughter of Margaret Mead. But she's done a book recently called Composing a Further Life. And she talks, Steve, about what we now have. And she calls it unanticipated longevity. If we're taking care of ourselves, of course, good genes don't hurt, then we have the possibility now to live far longer than during another era. And so I think even as youngsters prepare to go to college, they should think about this. Not just what will be my first career, my second career, my third career, because indeed one can possibly have that many different careers. Now that was a long answer to how I went from higher education into a museum. Well, but an interesting answer. And if you don't mind me following up on that Please. answer. How would you advise a student who's thinking about studying museum studies today? Do you advise them to study museum studies? Do you think they should study anthropology? Let's say uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to work at your museum. What would you hope that I would have done before I came there? Well, the first thing that I would say to anyone who's about to go off to college is choose the college based, not on what career you want exclusively, but where can you get a quality liberal arts education? Because you know as well as I that what you're really looking for, or you should look for, is a place that will prepare you. Take care of your ability to have good oral and written communication skills. Teach you not only about your own culture, but about the diversity of cultures in the world. Prepare you in terms of being able to operate in the world of that which is quantitative. Got to command the technology, we know that. And certainly one wants to know an enormous amount about the world, history, her story. With that kind of a quality undergraduate education, then you're prepared to go in any direction. A student that's showing a passion for museums the first thing I'm going to say to mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, please don't discourage that. Encourage it. If there's a passion about the arts, about science, about the world, as understood and displayed and educated about in museums, it's a wonderful, wonderful career. Well, fair enough. I mean, if we can get to that a little bit. I mean. You were president of Spelman for a long time, and mm -hmm. you had a very distinguished uh, record at Spelman. Do you recommend that students pick a school for, let's say, being an HBCU, or for being specifically good at museum studies, or, or how do you look at that? Mm. 
Well, the first thing I'm going to say is something that you know very well. And that is, in this country of ours, there's enormous diversity in schools. And so we've got to really ask this young'un, which I say respectfully, this young person, we've got to ask this young'un, what do you think will be the setting in which you will be able to soar to the height of your possibilities? Is it a big research university? or is it a small liberal arts college? Is it an HBCU, a historically black college and university? Is it a PWI, a predominantly white institution? Is it an institution in the middle of a great big urban area? Or is it frankly kind of rural and in the boonies? I mean, there are a number of possibilities here. And I think this is one question which is best responded to individual by individual. Now, in all of those years of being in higher education, one of the things that I found to be particularly important is size. You know, some students are just not going to be comfortable in an institution with 40,000 students and will prefer a small liberal arts college with 2,500. But most importantly, this is my real counsel, my free advice, a student should go there. Walk on that campus. How does it feel? How does it make you feel? Does it affirm who you are? And that is clearly one of the great advantages that HBCUs have, and that is when an African-American student walks on that campus and doesn't get any body language or messages that say, are you sure you're college material? When a young woman walks on a campus and is absolutely certain that she's never going to hear the question, honey, are you sure you can do physics? I mean, a university and a college should affirm not only where a student is, but affirm that that student has the possibility of flying. Well, I think that's a fair point. In terms of students flying and going forward, mm -hmm. could you say a word or two about what's, what are some of the career possibilities that a student would have from Spelman, Bennett, or any other college who comes to the Smithsonian? What would you have them do? Well, first I need to say this, that each and every time a student from Bennett College for Women or Spelman College walks into that museum, I am delighted. And if that student says, you know, Sister President, I've been thinking about museum studies. I've been thinking about art history. I've been thinking about anthropology, three clear avenues toward working in a museum. All I can do is to applaud that. Now the Smithsonian does have a very rigorous and I think very effective set of possibilities for young people. Internships, fellowships. Problem is, you know, there, there aren't an unlimited number of these. But for any student considering any career, you and I both know, Steve, it's a good idea to put your toe in before you jump all the way. I mean, one of your fields is law. If a student has a chance to intern in a law department or in a law office, do it. Find out if that really makes your soul sing. Fair enough. In terms of how the museum is divided, would you mind saying a word or two about how you divide up the exhibits and mm -hmm. where do they come from and who decides what exhibits are on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, a museum is really a place with a given focus, but with a multiplicity of individuals, skills, professions. A museum is a place that exhibits, 
that conserves, that educates about, in my case, the dynamic and diverse visual arts of Africa. And so if you walk into the museum at 950 Independence Avenue and begin to go through these galleries and just hopefully feel an enormous sense of power, of, well, yes, an enormous sense of depth. You're probably not going to stop and think, well, how did this chokwe mask get here? Or where in the world did this Yoruba piece of art come from? Who mounted this? Who wrote this text? Who painted these walls? In other words, when you walk into our museum, you're sensing, feeling, experiencing the work of an awful lot of people. Somebody built those cabinets. Somebody painted those walls. Somebody actually had to prepare the text. Somebody called a curator had to imagine this show. And so for young people who are thinking about going into the world of museums, then museum studies is a place to go. Because with museum studies, one will then at a given point be able to specialize. Are you interested in being the registrar who writes down everything that's coming in and everything that's going out in terms of art objects? Or are you interested in being, for example, the design person. Museum studies offers all of that. Art history, on the other hand, is a far more focused way to become educated and prepared to work in a museum. And that is the path that curators will tend to take. Curators are these wonderful, I even call them magical human beings who know so much about the aesthetics of a given people set within a given cultural context. And usually these are individuals with PhDs who begin to specialize at a given point, an African specialization, or maybe it is the art of the Americas. It could be the art of Native American people. It could be African American art. What I'm trying to say to you, Steve, is like almost any discipline or arena of work, it takes a lot to get prepared. But the first step, I think, is always passion. How do you feel about this? Well, I think that's interesting because the passion is important. I guess where I would go after that is thinking about the issue of how do we present that passion? Mm -hmm. And is the goal to present the passion to people who are already a little bit passionate about it or the people who don't know anything about it? So in other words, is the goal to bring in young school kids who perhaps don't know anything about subject X or Y or scholars who can really start to understand details about the Great Zimbabwe? That's a, that's a wonderful question. And the answer, from my perspective and the perspective of my colleagues at the museum, and it won't shock you, both, all of the above. We are the National Museum of African Art at the Smithsonian. And our responsibility is certainly as the only national museum focusing on the visual arts of Africa to be of service to school children and their teachers, which we can do by bringing them to us, by our taking material and exciting experiences to them, and thank goodness for the web. But we also have a responsibility to the casual tourist who's just here for the weekend, want to see Washington, D.C., came to the nation's capital, and for some reason has an interest in African art. 
But we also have a responsibility to the scholar, to the serious scholar whose life at that stage is focused on African art. Then there's a collector. These individuals, well, you know we're all collectors. I mean, the question is, what do you collect, right? But individuals who know an enormous amount about African art and collect either for their own pleasure and sometimes for commercial reasons. That's a wide range of folk. And so we like to say at our museum that it's our responsibility to honor the interests of the established African art museum goer, but we're always reaching out to new and diverse audiences. And let me just add this. One of the responsibilities we take very seriously is to reach out to the African immigrant communities in the greater Washington area. We're in our nation's capital. That means not only are there embassies of the 54 African countries, but there literally are communities of people who have come from these various countries. And while you would think, well, everybody in the African immigrant community knows about the African Art Museum, that's not necessarily so. And like anything that works well, there's got to be reciprocity. And so we're able to offer the excitement of this African art, but we also can learn from these sisters and brothers how they are responding to the art, to the art that comes from their homelands. Well, and speaking of the art coming from different homelands, uh, and I hope you don't mind this question because I think it's a little controversial, mm -hmm. who owns what pieces of art and who should own different pieces of art? So if art came from Tanzania mm -hmm. and somehow it's in your museum, why wouldn't the people in Tanzania say, well, we should own that? That is indeed a good question, and it opens the whole question of ownership. Again, because we are the National Museum of African Art, we have to take extreme care around questions of provenance, of ownership, if you will, of the history of the object. Let me put it in very crude language. We're not in the business of acquiring and exhibiting stolen goods. There was a convention, a UNESCO convention in the 1970s, which set up policies and procedures for acquiring artwork. We follow that to a T. In fact, the next time you're in our museum, go on level one, and you will see these really engaging figures from Mali, terracotta figures. We're talking about 13th, 14th century. We had some doubt about the provenance of those figures. And so photographs were taken, an official document was sent to the government of Mali saying we are not quite sure about these figures. Would you like them returned to you? The answer came back, we appreciate it. Please leave them there. I give that just as an example because, again, it's really important for us to follow that convention. But I want to remind you, Steve, that ours is a museum that collects and exhibits and educates about not only traditional art, which is what you're thinking of when you talked about ownership, but contemporary art, art that was made yesterday. You know, sometimes we really focus so much on the great art works of Africa, the Benin heads that we all have come to love some work out of Liberia, Mendi people's Bundu mask, because I know you know Liberia, that we forget that art is timeless. And today's contemporary art 
may one day be viewed by someone as historical or even traditional. But then how do we divide things up in a museum for the casual viewer? Do we do it by time? Do we do it by geography? All of the above, of the above and more. If you walk into our museum now, probably the first place that you will go will be the Walt Disney, we call it actually shorten it, we call it the Disney Tishman Collection. It's breathtaking. And here's the quick history. In 2005, the Walt Disney Company gave that collection of 525 pieces of exquisite traditional African art to the Smithsonian. They had bought it from Ruth and Paul Tishman, collectors in the city of New York. You would go there first, I'm suggesting you go there first, because you will see why we talk about museum quality African art. You're supposed to really be wowed out. You're supposed to say this is amazingly beautiful or powerful. But you might then go right across to another gallery into an exhibition called Mosaics, which has both traditional and contemporary art done by our three curators. It is what they are telling us is some of the best that our museum has collected over the last 10 years. And then you might wander into an exhibition that is really a little edgy and fabulous. It's the photography of Roger Ballin, US citizen who then moved to South Africa and has lived there for 30 years. And then if you wander, you're on the first level, down one more. The last gallery you're probably gonna end up in is just a stunning, a stunning, stellar exhibition called Earth Matters, Metaphor and Meaning in Earthworks, in the Artworks of Africa, excuse me. It opened on Earth Day, April 22nd. And Karen Milborn, the curator of that museum, has presented the largest exhibition we've ever done, 100 different objects of art traditional, contemporary, coming from, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> 25 of the 54 African countries, organized by sections or themes, the sixth of which is Earth Works. For the first time at the Smithsonian, this exhibition has led us to place art objects in the Smithsonian Gardens. Now, I just took you on a tour. You could do it virtually. You could go on our website. But you know, I'm a little, I'm a little old fashioned. No matter how much technology can help us to see artworks all over the world, Steve, there's something about physically standing in front of that piece of human creativity. And I think you're right. And I think the value of museums around the world speaks to exactly that point. And we only have a minute or two left, but maybe if you could say a word or two, if you wouldn't mind about, do you advise other countries in terms of how they can set up museums? Your questions are so good. Um, when I said we see ourselves being of service, that does extend beyond our own national borders. And we do what we can to be of assistance. For example, we at the moment have a partnership with the Nigerian National Commission of Museums and Monuments. We're also working with the government of Oman that connection between Oman in the Arabian Peninsula and East Africa. So the answer, the short answer, is yes. We want to be of service, 
But here's the last point. When we set up these relationships, these partnerships, we do so knowing that while we have much that we can teach, we also have much that we can learn from our colleagues in the museum world on the continent of Africa. And last question, thank you. Other last minute tips for other students who may be watching this today? Follow your passion. And I know that each of us must think about how we will make a living. But you know, we also want to live a good life. And if your passion is somehow in the world of art, follow it. Follow it. Fair enough. Well, Dr. Cole, thank you so much for coming on the show. You know you're welcome. If you would like additional information about Dr. Jeanetta Cole, please visit Africa si.edu. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education today. Thank you, Dr. Cole. You are so welcome. Thank you. This is